Matthew chapter 23, verse 25. If you're there, would you shout as loud as you can? I'm there. I'm there. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self indulgence. Blind Pharisee, listen how he's talking. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe, somebody say woe. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly. Spiritual catfish. Jesus was already addressing it. <laughs> you appear beautiful outwardly, but inside you are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness even so you also outwardly appear righteous so looking at your profile looking at your hashtag looking at your Jesus apparel looking at all your posts looking at all your scrolling looking at all your views you appear righteous to men but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. <laughs> our clause of concern and our verse of importance lives and takes residence in verse 26 of our foundational text where Jesus says, blind Pharisee, you blind religious person, you blind church goer, you blind teacher of the law. You blind individual who leads discipleship. You blind pastor. You blind spiritual leader. You blind religious one. You need to first cleanse the inside of the cup. That the outside of the cup may also be cleansed. He says, First clean the inside of the cup. First clean the inside of the cup. First clean the inside of the cup. Could it be peradventure one of the contributing factors to why our anxiety is so high is because we're more concerned with how we look on the outside of the cup versus what's really going on on the inside of the cup. Her adventure, could one of the contributing factors be to why we are bound to people pleasing and caring about what other people think is because we're more concerned about what people think about the outside of our cup than what is really going on on the inside. <laughs> Maybe one of the reasons we keep lying on social media. Whew, I told you I was going to be tight. We keep lying on social media, having happy posts with broken souls, trying to convince people that we're really at a place that we're not is because we are more concerned about how we look on the outside of the cup versus how we're really doing on the inside. The inside, the inside. Can I say it the way God gave it to me in study time? Can I say it the way God gave it to me? We have become decorated cups when we have been called to be overflowing vessels. Say it one more time. One more time. Your throat. I told you. We have been called to be overflowing vessels, but we have settled with becoming decorated cups we have makeup on the cups 
We make sure we go to the gym so that the cup can look good, but the inside of the cup is filthy. We care more about our degrees and our accolades. It's all about the outside of the cup. I wish I had like a compact little makeup thing with some foundation where I can make this cup up because more of us are trying to make up on the outside what we lack on the inside. I'm like, yes, sis, your makeup looks beautiful, but some of us need to eat it so we can get beautiful on the inside too. I know, I know, sir, you look straight and you got your body right, but maybe if we could look on the inside, you're not that swole, you're not really that kind, you really don't look that good. If we can look on the inside, on the inside of the cup, is this not what the psalmist told us? Is this not what David told us in a popular passage of scripture in Psalms 23 verse 5? He said, listen, the Lord has prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil and my cup. My cup overflows. We are called to be overflowing vessels, not just decorated cups. The true fulfillment of experiencing the peace of God requires spiritual maintenance on the inside. Church family, this requires an inside job. Can I get somebody to say inside job? Inside job. Requires something to happen on the inside. Maybe we are chronic overthinkers. <laughs> Talk to us, Holy Spirit. Maybe the reason we're addicted to chronic overthinking so much so to where it has caused a physical paralysis due to our mental analysis. And we tried to cure it with weed. We have tried to cure it with Hennessy. We have tried to cure it with an orgasm exchange. Y'all don't want to talk to me. We've tried to cure it by using people in relationship form as an attempt to distract ourselves from sadness. Did y'all hear what I just said? We've tried to cure it by using people in relationship form to try to distract us from sadness. But it's not working because the only way we can experience the true peace of God is it's going to require some spiritual maintenance on the inside. This is, church family, an inside job. An inside job. Maybe our stress is so high because of all the times we said yes when the Holy Spirit prompted you to say no. <laughs> Maybe this is why our stress is so high. Maybe this is why our stress is so high because we have been so caught up with being obsessed with trying to control the outcome. Obsessed with trying to control the results. Obsessed with trying to control how people see us. Obsessed, obsessed with trying to control how we're viewed. Or some of us, we're obsessed with a shortage mentality. So you grind and you hustle the way you do because you actually believe that your grind and your hustle is a determining factor to your opportunities versus God's sovereignty and God's timing. You've tried everything. You've tried ads. You've tried flyers. You've tried posters. You've tried everything, but it's not working because some things just require the timing of God. I know we're not going to get a lot of claps today. And it's okay. I want to help us to heal on the inside. It's going to require some spiritual maintenance. It is an inside job. Could it be the reason we keep on experiencing heartache and headache is because we can't discern dirty cups? <laughs> wow. We can't discern dirty cups. I don't know what y'all think, but I'm a man too. I see fine just like you see fine, bro. But I also have something called discernment where I see fine, but I also see a dirty cup. Okay. Ooh, he's fine. Ooh, he got a beer and a six pack, but his cup is dirty. 
The inside of his cup is dirty. I know it looks like a great opportunity, but the inside of the cup is dirty. I know this is offering you more money, but all money isn't good money. Some money is dirty money. I know it looks great, but the inside of the cup is dirty. Decorated cups. When we're called to be overflowing vessels. What has polluted us on the inside? Because we're consuming from a dirty cup. Hmm. Could we be sick on the inside? Experiencing emotional nausea because of who we're drinking after? This is so good, y'all. I told you it's tight, but it's right. See, there was this time I was driving in the car with my son. We were coming back from our haircut, and he asked me, Daddy, can I have some of your water? I said, sure, son, go ahead. He drinks my water. He says, okay, Daddy, thank you. He gives it back, and I'm about to drink it, but I guess just the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so, hold on. Before you drink that, look. And I just decided to look on the inside. Y'all miss what I just said. I just decided... To look on the inside, I saw Cheeto residue, <laughs> broccoli residue. The water had like a slight orange tint to it. And I was just like, son, you can have it. <laughs> you sure, daddy? Oh, daddy, sure. <laughs> you can have it. Whose backwash are you drinking? <laughs> if it wouldn't injure somebody, I'd throw it. Whose backwash are you drinking? Are you drinking the backwash of CNN and that's why your fear is so high? Are you drinking the backwash of what your mama said and that's why your anxiety is so high? Are you drinking the backwash of what an ex said and that's why you feel a certain way about yourself? Whose backwash are you drinking? I'm just trying to inform us. You might want to first look on the inside. Because the fulfillment of experiencing the peace of God requires spiritual maintenance on the inside this is an inside job. It's an inside job. On this afternoon, God wants to do some interior work. He wants to assist us by having a soul detox. And he wants to work on the inside. See, here's the thing about God. When God works on the inside, he's doing it with your future in mind. He's doing it with your purpose in mind. He's doing it with your calling in mind. He's doing it with your destiny in mind. Now it makes sense to me. Come here, all the people I said we need help. Now it makes sense to me why when I was in children's church, I would hear the church mothers and the church elders say this statement, baby, just stay on the potter's wheel. I really didn't know what that meant until I started reading the Bible for myself because I thought I was saved until I went to college. I recognized I thought I was saved because I'm a pastor's son. And I was claiming that I was saved because my parents were. It took for me to get 18 to recognize I can't get fooled by watching somebody else eat. So just because mom and daddy's saved and you have a praying grandmother doesn't mean you know him. So it took for me to start reading on my own to discover, oh, when they say stay on the potter's wheel, it's because there's some stuff that God wants to mold out. And there's some stuff that God wants to mold in. There's some things that God wants to mold out of our cup. He wants to take the lust out. He wants to take the arrogance out. He wants to take the resentment out. He wants to take the bitterness out. He wants to take the pride out. And he's not going to do it unless you say, here's my cup. This is an inside job. He wants to take out all of the anger. He wants to take out the stress. Believe it or not, he wants to take out the survivalist mentality because he didn't make you to survive. He made you to thrive. Why are you clapping? Because you're crawling faster than them when you got wings. Talk, Holy Spirit. I want you to experience a metamorphosis where I could take you from a butterfly to a caterpillar. You are actually clapping because you can crawl faster than them. You got wings, baby girl. You got wings now, my son. I want to take you higher. But will you allow me to do the inside work? The inside work. David puts it this way. In Psalms 139, verse 23, he says, Search me. <laughs> I 
I love how the Bible connects. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Now, this is the part we really don't want to pray. Test me. He says, don't just search me, but know my heart. And then after you know my heart, God, test me. I want you to test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way. Certain translations say wicked way. See if there's any wicked way, not on the outside of me. What does the Bible say? See if there's any offensive way where? In me. And lead me, there it is, and lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me, lead me. That's what this series is about. That's the direction that God caused this whole message to shift. He says, I want to lead people. So many people are saying, use me. But I had an epiphany about being used five years ago that changed my request. Because I used to always pray, God, use me. God, use me for your glory. God, use me for your kingdom. Use me as a man that could be a voice for my generation until I recognize something. Jesus said, many on that day will say, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we heal the sick in your name? Didn't we cast out devils in your name? And Jesus will tell them plainly, depart from me. I never knew you. And I was like, my God, if they were healing the sick in his name, God was using them. If they were casting out devils in his name, God was using them, but they didn't know him. It's similar to what we talked about with Moses. God said, speak to the rock. Moses hit the rock and water flowed. You would think that God is pleased with Moses because the water's flowing. But no, God was using Moses, but he wasn't pleased with him. So now my prayers change. Don't just use me, know me. Don't just use me, know me and lead me. Lead me. Lead me. Sheep can be led, but goats can't. Sheep want to be led because they recognize I am nothing without my master. Can I tell y'all something? You could come to church every single week and be a goat. You could be in the choir and be a goat. You could be a pastor and be a goat. You could run audio streaming and be a goat. The evidence that you are a sheep is my sheep know my voice. And my sheep, they follow me. I'm breaking stuff up here. My sheep know my voice, and they follow me. Sheep are slow, defenseless, dumb animals without their shepherd. And I'm not too prideful to ever admit that I'm dumb without my shepherd. I'm lost without my shepherd. I'm confused without my shepherd. So lead me beside still waters. Lead me beside still waters. Lead me in the time of peace. And God also lead me in the time of trouble. Lead me, God, when there's sunshine. And lead me, God, when there's a storm. Lead me, God, on the mountaintop. And lead me when I'm in the valley. Lead me when I'm in a pandemic. And lead me in a post-pandemic. In every season of my life, I need you to lead me. Because if you lead me, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. I just have a sneaky suspicion that there's somebody in the sanctuary and watching online, you know the only reason that you're here is because thou art with me. The only reason that you're still sane in the membrane is because thou art with me. The only reason that you're still not sliding down a stripper's pole is because thou art with me. The only reason you gave up marijuana is because thou art with me. The only reason I'm not fornicating anymore is because thou art with me. The only reason I'm not losing my mind is because thou art with me. The only reason I'm not watching porn anymore is because thou art with me. Thou art with me. And since you're with me, I will fear no evil. For thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Listen to what he's saying. The rod is for correction. When you correct me, that comforts me. <laughs> when you hear messages like this where the back of your neck is hot, it comforts me. It's not Jerry. Just don't shoot the messenger. It comforts me. Why? Because there was a time I could do my own thing and I felt nothing. But now when I'm about to say something, something pops me back in place. When I'm about to cuss that heifer clean out, something just pops me back in place. When I'm about to say something, I feel a oops, shut your mouth. That comforts me because I didn't have that before. 
that lets me know that you are with me. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup that the outside may be cleansed also. I want to speak around this thought from this subject. For part four of our stress management series, it's an inside job. It's an inside job. Let's pray. God, would you clean us on the inside? We live in a time and in an era, God, where everybody is so infatuated with the outside. Bigger house, bigger car, more followers, more views, more likes. We can get so caught up and we forget that we're not even of this world. That we are sojourners, that we are pilgrims, that we are aliens, ambassadors, supposed to represent another kingdom while we're in time. Help us to remember, oh God, that we are your representatives. Anoint my lips to be the PA system, the soundtrack of heaven. I always want to be a man that surrenders to the unctions of the Holy Spirit. The study means absolutely nothing if you are magnified and you aren't glorified. I'm asking that chains fall off this afternoon. I'm asking that yokes be broken because the anointing breaks yokes. Whoever has been battling with stress or anxiety or whatever the issue may be, I pray, God, that this will be their epiphany moment. So that when they look back on the files of their life of 2022, they can say it was on this day where change hit my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who agrees with that prayer would just shout in the room, amen. amen. I have a confession that I would like us to say. Everybody in the house and everybody online, if you could put this in the room in all caps. Y'all repeat after me. Can I get us to say this? Father, Father cleanse me on the inside. On the inside. Heal me. On the inside, so my cup can overflow. One more time. Father, cleanse me on the inside. Heal me on the inside. Can I get y'all to like hit your chest? Heal me on the inside, so my cup can overflow. Does anybody want to overflow? Overflow. As I was engaged in sermon prep and study this week. The Holy Spirit took the message that I had planned a whole nother route. Now, back three years ago, if that would have happened, if I could just be transparent, I would have had anxiety. Oh, Lord, what am I going to say? I don't want to get up here and look stupid, God. Uh, What am I going to say? I've learned just from walking with God. When where you thought you should be going isn't working, And that keypad cursor just keeps going, flash, 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 flash. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about, but every week I'm depending on God to speak to me. And when that cursor just like, nothing coming, nothing coming. (laughs) It can make you feel anxiety, but I've learned God wants to say something else. Because since I'm not God and he is, he knows there is something that my daughter or my son needs to hear in the house, online, watching the replay that you're unaware of because you're flesh and you live in time, but I oversee all. There's something I want you to say. And I always want to be a man, a servant, a brother, a leader that follows the direction of the Holy Spirit more than my logic. Say that one more time. Follow the direction of the Holy Spirit more than my logic. Can I mess y'all up? Sometimes the contributing factor to why some of us are so stressed is because we trust our logic more than our Lord. Ooh. I'm coming for all my intellectuals. We trust our logic more than our Lord. We trust our intellect more than our intercessor. (laughs) Like your intellect, your intellectualism, and your logic is supposed to complement your faith, not contradict your faith. There are a lot of agnostics and atheists who say this doesn't make any logical sense, and they use their logic and their intellect to dismiss the faith. But I'm like, okay, my logic and my intellect actually complement my faith. Like it makes logical sense to me to pray without ceasing. That that makes logical sense. 
Because Jesus said, okay, these kind only come out by prayer and fasting. Jerry doesn't know when I'm going to encounter a these kind. So I'm going to have a prayer life and a fast life so that if I ever encounter a these kind, I have spiritual authority to cast it out. So it makes sense to me to pray in the morning. It makes sense for me to pray over my children because I don't know what's coming. That makes logical sense to me. Like it, it complements my intellect to always acknowledge him in all that I do first. Because I don't know, I'm young. I don't know if I should sign this contract. I don't know if I should make this commitment with this land. I need to get some godly counsel. There are safety in a multitude of counsel. That makes logical sense to me. I haven't been to this height before. Never criticize somebody who has fallen from a height you've never been to. The wind blows stronger up there. The wind blows stronger up there. It's colder up there. You don't know what it's like to be up there. <laughs> that makes logical sense to me. Let me give you Bible, just for all of my logical Christians. Uh, let me give you Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, the apostle Paul puts it this way. For the message of the cross is foolishness, illogical. Is stupid. To who? Those who are perishing. <laughs> Did y'all hear me? To those who are dying, it's foolish. But to us who are being saved, bruh, this is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Has not God made foolish what you think is smart? Is Jesus really your Lord or is your logic? come for somebody's life, but I'm just being obedient. See, when we only go off of logic and we say, okay, logic is Lord, we cause ourselves by default to encounter two things. The first thing is the devil can now lie to you with facts. <laughs> he can lie to you with facts. And I know some of us are like, that's a contradiction. How do you lie with facts? It's easy. We walk by faith and not by sight. What you see is a fact. It's a lie that'll stop you. So if you only go off of your logic, you'll always go off of what, you'll see, what you see. Okay? I can keep going. It's a fact that we have sinned. All of us. Anybody who says, I haven't, that's your sin. You're a liar. Okay, we all have sinned and God hates sin. It's a lie. He hates you. See, see that you too dirty. You messed up. You know what you did? Who are you to try to tell anybody? You can't talk. God hates this type of stuff. You too messed up. That's a lie. Did you mess up? That's a fact. Are you a mess up? That's a lie. See, he can lie to you with facts. Are y'all getting this? It's a fact Lazarus died. His cardiac activity has ceased. He is dead. It's a fact that we asked him to come and save him while he was sick. It's a fact that Jesus did not come when we wanted him to. It's a fact that he is in the grave. It's a lie that he's going to stay there. I wonder how many of my logical people are looking at stuff and you're quitting because it's a fact is dead. But you forgot you serve a resurrector. I'm trying to help somebody. It's a fact. There are laws of thermodynamics. It's a fact, Peter. There is something called gravity. You take your butt and step out this boat, you will go under the water because there's something called gravity. That's a fact. It's proven. It's a lie that God will never let you drown. Are y'all seeing this? So when you only go off of logic and you only go off of intellectualism and that doesn't complement your faith, but it contradicts your faith, the enemy can now lie to you with facts. <laughs> this is so good, y'all. The intelligence of the intelligent, he will frustrate. 
This is why some intelligent people are so frustrated with you because it's a fact they're smarter. It's a lie that they have more oil. See, they got more degrees than you. They got more degrees than you do, but you got more God. The second thing that can happen if you only go off of logic and your intellect is you will limit your experience of the miraculous. You'll limit it. Many people never see miracles because they only believe logic. But miracles override your logic and it won't make logical sense. It doesn't make logical sense for a fire to be hot Throw three Hebrew boys in a fire and they not get burned. But if you only operate in logic, you'll never experience a fourth man in the fire with you. There are a lot of times God has wanted to be the fourth man in the fire with you, but your logic wouldn't let you take the risk and step in fire. Talk, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit rerouted this message. I had a plan to go one way. God said, no, let's go another way. I want us to talk about this because many times, Jerry, a lot of people, especially in your position, leaders, they think that they love the church. And the reason we make the erroneous assumption that we love the church is because of how much we give, how much we counsel, and how much we serve. But God is like, truthfully, they don't love the church. They love their platform. They love their ministry. See? In in fact, the reason many people want a platform, want a stage, want more subscribers, want more views is so that they could chase their own glory by doing the Lord's work. And you can't say it's about me when I'm doing it for God. I want you to love my church and the litmus test on how you could always tell if somebody loves their platform or loves the church is if they do not tell you the truth. Did y'all hear what I just said? Do not tell you the truth. And I discovered this years ago, Western Hemisphere Christianity and the America church has a sweet tooth. We love sugar. Packed out arenas, packed out stadiums. It's almost as though many church attendees, not all of us, but many church attendees, we have consumed so much sugar to where we have spiritual cavities. (laughs) And when we hear a sermon that has salt in it, it tastes like judgment. Because I'm binging sugar. I like sugar when you're called to be salt. So I'm going to be obedient and I'm going to give you some salt on today. Because I recognize a lot of church attendees, we are choosing churches. And what we're really saying is, pastor, if you love me, lie to me. If you love me, lie to me. Tell me that God is going to blow my mind and the best days are ahead of me. But don't tell me, like exclude obedience, exclude living my, bo- living my life as a living sacrifice, exclude applying godly principles to my life. Just tell me my best days are ahead of me. Leave out the if and the whatsoever and the but of the Bible. Just tell me what I want to hear. Lie to me. If you love me, lie to me. Tell me I'm going to have a financial breakthrough in the next 10 days if you shout like you lost your mind. Matter of fact, your name might be on the list that Joe Biden just released to release all of your college tuition. If you love me, lie to me. Don't talk about my spending habits of eating out. Don't talk about that. Don't talk about how I'm maxing out my credit cards. Don't talk about that. Don't you dare talk about my Amazon account. You got a box at your door every day. Don't talk about that, though. Don't talk about how I'm wearing my wealth. Don't talk about that. Don't talk about how you have more on on your clothes than you do in your savings. Don't talk about that. If you love me, lie to me. Give my children what they want to wear. How are your children going to be overdressed but undereducated? Y'all talk, make it make sense. Like, how are you flyer than your grades? If you love me, lie to me. 
I'll join your church if you lie to me. I'll tithe if you lie to me. I'll give if you lie to me. I'll say I love my pastor if you lie to me. But I have to give an account to God for every message I spoke before you. And I love you too much to play with your eternal placement. And I'm going to tell you the truth. And what God told me to say is if you deliver another message in this stress management series talking about your neo, neuro uh, tra transmitters, I could barely say it, your biological clock and all that stuff without mentioning they are so stressed because I am not first. All of the stuff that you're talking about, that's great, son. I gave it to you. But I need them to understand they're stressed because I'm not first. I'm not first in their mind. I'm not first in their marriage. I'm not first with their spending. I'm not first with their habits. I'm not first with their time. I'm not first with their pursuits. I'm not first. They're so stressed because they want me to bless what's not my will. And they're coming to me. And they're saying, bless this God. And I'm like, I didn't send that. And then you come and say, pastor, I'm stressed. They're stressed because I'm not first. I'm an elective to them. Prayer is their crisis line. It's not their intimacy session. So you're stressed out because you don't know me. You don't spend time with me. You don't bask in my presence. You don't open up and feast on my word. I'm not talking about five minutes over your food praying. I'm not talking about praying in traffic. I'm talking about devoted, uninterrupted time when it's just you and God. I'm so stressed I can't sleep. God has said, no, they're stressed and they can't sleep because I'm not first. If they had a prayer life, your prayer life strengthens your neurological mind to have the muscles to cast down thoughts. See, if I tell all of us right now, in your mind, I want you to view a red horse. You can see it. Now, if I say, okay, imagine a brown horse. You can see it. You just proved to me you have the power to change your mind. Now, if you do that every day for 30 minutes or an hour, you are training your mind to cast down thoughts and to cast down imaginations. Your prayer life is strengthening your mental fortitude. You're stressed because we don't talk. We don't talk. This is not insomnia. This is a time for you to intercede. All day long, you gave my time to something else. You gave my time to Netflix. You gave my time Kiki Keen in that boy's face. You gave my time to Kiki Keen in that girl's face. You gave my time to Hulu. You gave my time to Instagram. You gave my time to Facebook. The reason you can't sleep is because it's time now for us to talk. We have to talk. You hurting and you crying, but we're not talking. That's why you're stressed. I'm not first. I'm not first. If you love me, though, pastor, lie to me. Talk about cortisol. Talk about dopamine. Give me some therapy. And God's saying, your biggest therapy is putting me first. It's crazy. We demand truth in every area of our lives except God. Like you want the doctor to tell you the truth about the condition of your child, your loved one. You don't want the doctor to lie to you. If he does, you will sue them. <laughs> you get on a plane, you want to know that this pilot truthfully went to flight school. Don't play with me. I'm not your test subject. <laughs> you want your spouse to tell you the truth. Who is that texting you? That's not Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut don't text this time of night. <laughs> I just gave somebody game away. <laughs> that's why Pizza Hut be hitting you up. That, that's not Pizza Hut. You want them to tell you the truth. You would want your children to tell you the truth. Okay, one of y'all are going to get in some serious trouble if y'all don't tell me who took that blue marker and wrote on that wall. Okay, y'all don't want to tell the truth. All of y'all catching these hands. Everybody. <laughs> you want... Your children to tell the tr truth. You want your doctors to tell the truth. Why can't I tell you the truth? Why? Like, it's like we love truth as long as it enlightens us. We hate truth as soon as it convicts us. <laughs> Somebody say it is an inside job. Yeah, you don't understand. I'm just so stressed and 
I'm so lonely, Pastor. You doing cuffing season in October? I'm waiting for it. I, my singleness, it feels like, if I could be honest, an asylum of loneliness. <laughs> an Alcatraz of isolation. I, I just feel so alone. I'm like, okay, you do understand, loneliness always arrives when purpose has been undiscovered or unworked. Okay, put my foot on the gas a little more. When your kingdom waiting never feels like it. Ooh, it got quiet. Adam didn't feel like he was waiting. Ruth didn't feel like she was waiting. She was just working. Loneliness arrives when purpose has been undiscovered or unworked. And many times we have mislabeled the spirit's quest to awaken purpose as loneliness. In fact, when you are in purpose, you desire to be alone sometime. Okay? Let me give you Bible so you can see I'm not giving you opinion. Okay? Um, Matthew chapter 14, because I want us to see that Jesus constantly sought to be alone. All right? Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, it says, And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up on the mountain by himself. To pray. Now, when evening came, now how I read my Bible, I'm like, man, how long were you praying? It just says he went on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. I'm like, man, he must have been praying for a minute. It could have been two. Were you praying till six? I don't know. Give you more Bible. Luke chapter five, verse 16. If you still disagree, please disagree with this one. Um, it's real short, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So, loneliness is not the absence of people. It's the absence of purpose. Okay? Loneliness is not the absence of people. It's the absence of meaning. Loneliness is not the absence of people. It is the absence of gratitude because gratitude and pity will never be romantically involved. Let me go a little deeper. Purpose requires for you to pour. I could do a whole sermon on what are you pouring out? Your peace, your joy, but purpose requires for you to pour. Therefore, when you're alone, it's rejuvenating. <laughs> when my wife and I, we took a break for our sabbatical, that was so rejuvenating. When you're alone and out of purpose, being alone is aggravating. Right. So here's the question. When I'm alone, is it refreshing, rejuvenating, or aggravating? Because when I'm in purpose and I'm alone, I need a break. Yes. I've been pouring so much that I need some time to be refueled. God said, okay, I need them to understand. Until I'm first, you're going to be stressed out no matter what you do. You could be a millionaire, you'll be stressed out. Health perfectly fine, you'll be stressed out. Married or unmarried, you'll be stressed out. Because the premise and the beginning of experiencing the peace of God is to have him first. Deliverance, hear me, deliverance from mental torment. Deliverance from emotional, and ex from emotional anxiety is to have the order right. God's first. When the order is wrong, everything in your life will be off. So I'm trying to get us to see outside of every other part of this series, the reason we're so stressed is because the order's off. It's off. He's saying, I, I want to be first. I want to be the one that you seek. I want to be the one that you cry out to. I want to be the one that fulfills you. I want to be the one that gives you confidence. I want to be the one that you praise. I want to be the one that you worship. I want to be the one that you pursue. I want to be the one that gives you joy. I want to be the one that gives you high. I want to be the one that takes you there. I want to be the one. Love me first. Love me first. So how do we get there though? Because how I was growing up, the pastor would do the benediction right here. And you'd be walking out like, man, I got to put him first. I don't even know how, though. <laughs> Every time you see this cup, you're going to be thinking about, man, I need to focus on the inside. But what does that look like? 
How, how does God clean you on the, from the inside out? It's simple. Three points, and I'm going to get out your way. He cleans the inside by first cleaning your mind, your heart, and then your spirit. Can I get everybody to say mind, <clears throat> heart, and spirit? Now, the mind is the most complex one. Because what's on the inside of here is because of all the stuff that we have put in here. Be transformed by the renewing of your, y'all talk to me, mind. So they're, they're components of the mind. Similar to the peers chart that I show often, I want you to see this minds chart. If you could put this on the screen for me, Carl. They're components of your mind. You have your intellect, your imagination, your will, and your memory. Go ahead, take your picture because I need y'all to remember this. It's going to help you with cleansing on the inside. You have your intellect, your imagination, your will, and your memory. Okay, can I get everybody? I feel like y'all taking pictures. Y'all taking pictures? <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> intellect, imagination, will, and memory. Can I get everybody to say it with me? Say intellect, intellect. imagination, imagination. Will, will, memory. All right, so now your intellect is the library of your mind. Your imagination is the canvas of your mind. Your will is the hard drive of your mind. And your memory is the steering wheel of the mind. So, so we can understand this. Your intellect is your library. That's all the stuff that you put in your mind. Everything you store here. Now, each component of your mind affects every other part of your mind. I'm going to prove it to you. So if I put pornography in the library of my mind, well, guess what that's going to do? That's going to affect my imagination. So now every time I see a sister, I imagine seeing her do things that I saw from the library of pornography. So I can't even see my sisters or my brothers, because sisters are ratchet too. I can't even see my brothers in a right light because I have stored perversion in my mind. And so the first thing that hits my mind is perverted things. And so now, since it has been in my library and I imagine it, I start to deal with my will. Now I desire to do some of these things. <laughs> I desire to do some of these things. It works the same way with pain. If I have pain here, something happened in your life that hurt, trauma, whatever it may be. I'm an advocate for therapy. Y'all know we do therapy Thursdays. I'm not that pastor. I'm a pastor that understands, okay, you need Jesus through therapy. Okay? So something happened in your past that was painful. Guess what? That affects your imagination too. So you already told yourself, I'm not coming to singles night. I don't have time for anybody to hurt me like he did. I don't have time for anybody to hurt me like they did. Anytime somebody talks to you, you arrest them immediately as a possible offender too. Is this making sense? Because I experienced it in my library, I imagine them doing the same thing, and my memory takes me back to what it felt like. So now, in my will, I ain't doing that. So when he says, first cleanse the inside of the cup, this is how it starts. If you begin to store the word in your intellect, if you begin to store sermons in your intellect, if you begin to, stir, to store what God has said about you in your intellect, that's the inside, what happens now is you begin to imagine yourself free. You begin to imagine yourself healed. You begin to imagine what would it look like if I'm not so easily offended. And now that I imagine those things, my will starts to change. And I start to want to pray. And I start to want to worship. I don't have to have Tanisha say, Lift your hands. I'm doing it on my own because in my own time, I've been storing God's word in my heart. Hide the word in my heart so that I may not sin against thee. And it's affecting my imagination. That's how it starts. Cleanse me on the inside. You got to watch what you're putting on the inside. What's affecting your mind? 
I'm telling you now, prophetically, some of us need to get off social media. Get off. I was speaking to a group of men this week, and I said, you know, you could tell a lot about a man by who he follows. The brothers are really, yeah. How many IG models you follow, bro? Like, I'm not a woman. But if I was, if a guy asked me out on his social media, the first thing I would do is look at all the people he follow. That's just me. I'm not, I'm not a female. Thank God I'm not. But if I was, this is something I would do. I would want to see what does he want constantly in his face. I would just want to see it. Just so that I could determine. Like, because that's going to kind of let me know what you might expect about me. That's not judging. That's observing. Nothing wrong with observing. <clears throat> See how quiet them claps are? <laughs> the Bible says, test the spirit by the spirit. You don't put your emotional at the stake of some brother that says, can we talk? You don't put your emotional stake on some sister that say, bro, you cute? I know I'm cute. I need to know what's on the inside of your cup, though. I'm tired of finding out that it's bad fruit after I took a bite. I want to know before, okay, y'all don't want to talk to me. Y'all don't want to talk to me. I don't want to learn through experience anymore. Can I learn through wisdom this time, God, please? Let me see like a worm come out the fruit or something. I don't want to bite it to figure out anymore. <laughs> I want to heal and work on the inside. Now, here's the part, though. This is really the only part that the enemy should be able to agitate with us. This part right here. Because your memory is not saved. Your memory does not love Jesus. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Your memory does not care about the spirit. Your memory will always take you back to places where you were sinning against God and enjoying it. That's your memory. Your memory, the enemy likes to take your memory on dates. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And he will have a full-blown conversation with your memory. Some of us have gotten mad because of the thoughts that we are entertaining in our memory. Some of us right now are bitter because of stuff we keep on rehearsing in our memory. We have all of this anger on the inside because we keep on allowing the enemy to take your memory on a date. He's taking your memory on a date tonight. He's taking your memory on a date tomorrow. He's taking your memory. Matter of fact, not taking your date, your mind on a date tomorrow. Y'all sleeping together. I'm going to sleep with that thought process where you can't even sleep tonight because I'm counseling your memory. This is where he parks. This is where he parks. I don't believe it's a coincidence. Call me churchy or this may be a stretch if you want to. I don't believe it's a coincidence. Facebook has share your memories. I don't believe it. Five years ago on this day, I'm like, Lord, why you show me this? <laughs> it takes you back somewhere. Your memory. So first cleanse the inside of the cup. How? You have to start storing the word in your mind. Start imagining yourself experiencing the promises of God. And you keep on doing, look, it first starts as discipline and then it manifests as desire. It first is a discipline. You're not going to want to pray. You're not going to want to listen to sermons. You're not going to want to fast. It is a discipline, but as you keep on doing it, it becomes your desire. So now it has affected your will. I will to do the will of God. So when you say things like God gives me the desires of my heart, biblically and accurately, that means my desires match his desires. So what I desire is what he desires. And he gives me the desires of my heart because my desires are his. Is this making sense? Point number two, I'm going to go faster because I'm out of time. Your heart. Your heart. For God to have us experience purification of the heart. Purification, the main word there is pure. Pure actually means unmixed. That's what it means to be pure, unmixed. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Jesus says, blessed are the pure 
in heart, for they will see God. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, man, my heart's not pure at all. So I definitely ain't going to see God. So I, I have to understand what he's saying. When he's saying, blessed are pure, blessed are those who are unmixed. Because pure means unmixed. Blessed are those who aren't trying to mix culture with kingdom, for they will see me. Blessed are those who aren't trying to mix their way with my way, for they will experience seeing me. It's when I no longer try to do God's thing and my thing. I'm trying to help us, y'all. That's why a lot of us are stressed, because you have a will and God has a will, and they're both fighting. Why is your marriage on life support? Your wife has a will, you have a will, God has a will. They're all different. So you're stressed. On your job, boss has a will, you have a will, co-workers have a will, God has a will. They're all different. You're all stressed out. So it starts with pure. It's the cycle of the mind, if you will. My sisters have this purification process, the cycle. It is the shedding of something old. Watch this, so that she can conceive. My cycle is a purifying of something old, old lining, so that now my body, if the timing is right, can ovulate where I could conceive. The reason God wants to have the cycle of the heart is so that you can conceive his word. And once you conceive his word, you'll give birth to blessings. I hope y'all getting this. But you have to conceive it. But if you're not having a cycle, you can't get pregnant. You limit the possibility of you being able to conceive. As God is shedding away your old self, you have to conceive your new self. When Jesus was on the cross, there was a shedding of blood, which caused for our old self to pass away, and we can now experience our new self in him. Is this making sense? Last point, your spirit. How, how, do, how do we get cleansed on the inside? Got to do with your mind. I already broke that down. Got to deal with your heart. We already broke that down. Your spirit is the part of you that has to surrender. That has to surrender. Stop being so caught up with looking good on your flesh. I want you to live good in your spirit. This means you got to watch the gates. Your eye gate and your ear gate affects your spirit. It's going to be hard for you to stop having profanity in your spirit. When, when you get in your car, you leave here, you're getting cussed out by your playlist. I have to tell you the truth, y'all. So why do I have this profanity in my spirit? Your ear gates hear bleep, bleep, bleep all day. And you just bob your head, bleep, bleep, bleep all day. Bleep, bleep, bleep all day. So when somebody gets on your nerves, what you going to do? Bleep, bleep, bleep all day. <laughs> it's your spirit. What are you feeding your spirit? A lot of our spirit man has backwash in it. Because we're drinking after dirty vessels. But this message is prophetic. And I always will be a man that's obedient. God's saying, tell them. They're stressed because I'm not first. I'm an option. I'm the crisis line God. I'm the Santa Claus God. Give me your wish list. Then my children and good fathers want to spend time with you. I'm a dad. I want to spend time with my children. If something hurts them, I want to know. I could tell each cry from each of my children. When they get too quiet, I know to go look for them. And I know how to get my children's attention. I'm, lock, I'm talking to them. My daughter's not listening. I'll take her iPad. Look at me. God has taken a lot of our iPads. Whatever your iPad may be, it could be in a relationship. It could be a job, money. But he said, hey, I need you to look at me. You're stressed because we don't talk. And I love you too much to let you live your life and not have relationship with me. And we should be thankful that God loves you and me so much where he's saying, whatever I gotta do to get your attention, I'm gonna do it. Because what I put on the inside of you, 
your bloodline needs, the earth needs, and the generation needs. And I refuse to leave you alone. Stress for many of us is God saying, can we talk? So I just feel this in this moment. I usually have a different way that we end service, but everybody who's honest enough, I'll be the first one to stand, who's honest enough to admit he hasn't been first. And I'm stressed because I'm trying to make decisions on my own. Would you stand so we could pray? Let's pray together. Judge-free zone. Sit, don't mean that you're <laughs> anything. This is for us who are honest. I haven't, I haven't been putting you first. I haven't. Now, I want you to hear my prayers first. I want you to hear me, but I'm stressed because I have minimal surrender. When we get a larger facility, this is going to be the time where I say, y'all come up front. Right now, it'll be the traffic jam. <laughs> but with all seriousness, and whenever Tanisha is ready or wherever she is, have her join me. I want to pray. Because I, I'm not exaggerating. I really felt this. I'm studying, I felt this. All of that stuff, that management, it's not going to work until I'm first. So if we could, let's just pray together. Lift our hands. We're going to pray. And I want us to, maybe for the first time this year or our first time in our life, I want our hearts to be open. Father, we, we stand before you with our hand raised as a sign of surrender. And Father, first, we have to say we repent. We repent, oh God, for all of the times we've been trying to figure it out or work it out or smoke it out or drink it out or sex it out. Anything we've been trying to do to remove the pain, remove the anger, remove the stress outside of you. God, we repent because we can't do it without you. And I pray, God, that this is the moment where we come to the end of ourselves. Enough with what we think. Enough with how we want it. God, would you saturate our spirits to such a degree where we crave you. We want you. We want your will. We want your pursuits. Help us to be individuals, oh God, who put our hand on your wrist to feel your pulse. What's beating after your heart? What's hurting your heart? What's breaking your heart? What are you after? What are you longing for? What do you hate? And give us the heart to get on the same cadence with you. Even though we never can fulfill it. And that's something that Jesus has done. Let that be our target. Yes. Let that be our target. To be like Christ. Forgive us, oh God, for binging sugar and acting as though we have more time. Because truly, procrastinating is arrogance. It's saying that I'll have the time to do this again later. Forgive us for all the time we've been procrastinating on things that you've been telling us do today. Rather, if it's call someone today, break up with somebody today, end something today, throw some food away, end the ha whatever it is, God, would you give us the strength to have today faith, right now? You told us in your word the day we hear your voice. To not harden our hearts. We're praying for soft hearts. We're praying for moldable hearts. We're praying for hearts that are like the clay after the rain. Help us to be moldable and pliable so that you can mold out of us what's offensive to you. Just like the psalmist says, search us, oh God. Yes. Search us. Know our anxious thoughts. Test us so that you can remove any way that's not like you. We've lost focus. We've lost focus. We started this year off. 2022 is the year I'm going to do this. We lost focus. Help us to get our focus back. And I pray for those, God, who always traffic in logic lanes. Help them to understand that you transcend logic. It is on this day that we surrender. In Jesus' name. We pray, amen.